Hello dear student, this is Dr. Seher from Dentabas, your best online mentor for the preparation of IMBD 8 at an AFK exam. Please like and subscribe to my channel on YouTube and follow me on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok and LinkedIn. Please do visit my website at dentabas.com where I'm offering different personalized and self-study smart learning programs at a very affordable cost for my dear hardworking students. So today we are going to take a topic of endodontics that is endodontic surgery. So let us try to dig deeper into the concepts of surgery. So first of all we should know what is the classification. So according to Gutman and Ingall they have given different classifications of endodontic surgery. So as per uh, Gutman the endodontic surgeries they are divided into the periradicular surgery which is further subdivided into the curettage, root and resection, root and preparation and filling. Then we have the fistulative surgeries, which is divided into incision drainage, cortical trephination, decompression. And the lastly, we have the corrective surgery. So corrective surgeries are divided into the perforation repair. Then you have the correction of resorptive lesion, carious and any mechanical perforation that happened during the procedure periodontal management, root resection, root amputation, tooth resection that is hemisection or bicuspidization and intentional reimplantation. Now let us see the classification you have according to Ingle. So Ingle has classified the endodontic surgeries into surgical drainage, periradicular, corrective surgeries, replacement surgeries like doing the extraction or the reimplantation. And the implant surgery. Now, the surgical drainage is further subdivided into IND or cortical trephination, that is your fistulative surgery, while periradicular surgeries are curettage, biopsy, root in resection, root on preparation and filling, like you do it in apicectomies. Then the corrective surgeries, we know it's divided into repair of your perforation, any mechanical perforation, resorptive lesion repair, like internal or external resorption, hemisection, and root resection. Now the implant surgery are further divided into endodontic implant or the root form osseointegrated implant which are the most popular ones. Now let us quickly see the indications and contraindications for the endodontic surgery. So indication is when you need any surgical drainage, uh, failed non-surgical endo treatment, uh, calcific metamorphosis in your pulpal space, procedural error like your instrument is breaking or ledging is non-negotiable in case of root perforation or you did the overfilling or in case of anatomic variations like you have root dilaceration or having a root fracture. Now when we talk about the contraindication, some of the relative contraindication definitely depends upon the patient medical status. If we have any problem with this immune, immunocompromised patient like uncontrolled diabetic patient, heart patient with a recent heart attack, then you have some anatomical consideration for endodontic surgery like if the nasal floor, the sinus or uh, the nerve, like inferior elbow nerve, is very close to the surgical site. So, surgical drainage is mainly indicated when purulent or hemorrhagic exudates form within the soft tissue and the alveolar bone. And that's a result of a symptomatic periradicular abscess. So, you can see the picture here. So, we are going to do the incision, the surgical incision, and then doing the IND. So, by for doing the incision and drainage, you are giving an incision in a soft, fluctuant, and the most prominent part of the swelling. Now the cortical trephination is also doing the incision but here in cortical trephination you are drilling the bone, you are making a hole inside the bone for uh, evacuating all the contents out. So the main purpose of both the IND and the cortical trephination is definitely to relieve the patient from the pain and the pain that was occurring due to the pressure of the accumulated exudate. So when you do the drainage all that pressure will be relieved because the exudate it comes out. Now let us see what are local anesthesias we are requiring for the oral surgery. Like lidocaine, we know it's one of the most popular one. It has a prolonged duration of action and as compared to other anesthesia, it has low toxicity and the allergenic potential. Articane, it has more ability to penetrate into the bone. So that is also being used. Or the bupivacaine that we also called as mepivacaine. It's definitely one of the longest acting anesthesia we have and also helps in post-operative pain control. Now, hemostasis, how you control the bleeding during the surgery. 
uh, is by using if especially if the patient has is hemophiliac or he has some bleeding disorder or he was on antiplatelet anticoagulant therapy he has more chances of bleeding so these are some of the hemostatic agents that we can keep ready with like bone wax vasoconstrictors uh, ferric sulfate thrombin gel calcium sulfate gel foam absorbable collagen or surgical but we know the most uh, uh, primary method of achieving hemostasis to apply pressure to the area so before we continue with the uh, flaps or different flaps used for endodontic surgery we should know some principles of flap design like incision should be made parallel to the supraosteal vessels you don't give any incisions over the bony eminences and uh, flaps and incision should be placed and repositioned over a solid bone including the full extent of the lesion and of course you avoid any incision given in the nerve blood vessel or any major muscle attachment area tissue retractor you are using and the extent of horizontal incision should be adequate to provide you proper visual and operative access to the area now when we classify the flap we know full thickness flap and the partial thickness flap uh, now the full thickness flap is including all the layers including the periosteum of the bone that means it include the epithelium the connective tissue which is the mucosa part and the periosteum but when we talk about the slip th uh, split thickness or the partial thickness it will include the epithelium and connective tissue that is mucosa but no periosteum now according to gutman and harrison they have divided the flap into full mucoperiosteal and the limited mucoperiosteal so if you can see in full mucoperiosteal there is no attached gingiva around the neck of the crown it is completely exposing the bone while in case of limited mucoperiosteal it will show remaining attached gingiva too if you can see it is still present around the neck so full mucoperiosteal flap can be divided into triangular rectangular trapezoidal horizontal envelope or papilla base while the limited mucoperiosteal are divided into submarginal curved semilunar or submarginal scallop rectangular which is called as lubeck oceanbeck flap so of course having a full mucoperiosteal flap it give you very good access uh, to the surgical site rapid wound healing and there is minimal disruption of the blood supply but yes full mucoperiosteal flap is going to be a thick flap you have loss of soft tissue attachment loss of crestal bone height and post surgically it is difficult to place the flap it can also lead to flap dislodgement now when we talk about limited mucoperiosteal flap the advantage is that marginal interdental gingiva they are not involved and there is unaltered soft tissue attachment level and crestal bone is not exposed there and you have better wound healing potential but the disadvantage of the limited mucoperiosteal flap is definitely disruption of the blood supply flap shrinkage chances are more it's not easy to re reapproximate the limited mucoperiosteal flap and there's chances of delayed secondary wound healing that means more chances of scarring now if you see the first uh, mucoperiosteal full thickness triangular flap here so triangular flap you are giving the circular incision you can see and there is only one vertical releasing incision here so it is good for doing the periapical surgeries in the posterior area especially for the shorter route and this flap gives a better integrity of the blood supply and just adding one vertical releasing incision uh, however this flap has limited accessibility gingival attachment get detached and tension creation is more on retraction now when we talk about the rectangular flap again you have a circular incision here directly given into the gingival sulcus you can see this but there are two vertical releasing incision here that is a rectangular flap which is used for periapical surgery multiple teeth can be performed this surgery large lesions in case of lateral root repair and rectangular flap definitely will have better accessibility visibility as compared to triangular flap uh retraction on the uh, tension on the retraction of the flap is lesser here however with the rectangular flap the blood supply is less more chances of gingival recession and the crestal bone loss so this is you can see this is the horizontal flap we have which is having only the circular incision chances of cervical resorptive defect getting healed by the horizontal flap is good for periodontal procedure horizontal flap is just the horizontal incisions so you don't have any vertical releasing incision here so you will have limited accessibility and visibility of course because you have less incision difficulty to reflect and 
retract. Now the semilunar flap, if you can see here, so semilunar flap, you are going to do the sulcular incision and you can see there is a curved incision. So in the semilunar flap, you are going to give a curved incision in the alveolar mucosa and that arch gingiva. So the curve will start from the alveolar mucosa and it will go to that arch gingiva and then it will trace back to the alveolar mucosa. So it starts from here, alveolar mucosa coming to attach gingiva and then going back to the alveolar mucosa like a semilunar, like a half moon crescent shape incision you have in semilunar flap. So semilunar flap definitely for trephination, it is a good flap for aesthetic crown requirements if it is there. Incisions and reflection time is definitely less and maintain integrity of gingival attachment very good. Crest and bone uh, loss chances are less. But when we talk about the disadvantage, semilunar flap definitely is difficult to reposition. It crosses the root eminence, which may not include the entire lesion also. And it has limited accessibility and visibility along with predisposition to stretching, tearing and tendency for higher chances of hemorrhage. So now we can see a very important flap of endosurgery that is called as ocean back lubeck flap. So in this flap, uh, we are giving the horizontal incisions, but these incisions, if you can see, they are not given in the sulcus. They are given in the labial or the buccal attached gingiva. So ocean back lubeck flap, of course, in case of aesthetic requirements, periapical surgery, especially in the anterior region or when the tooth has long root and having a wider band of attached gingiva. So having this ocean Lubeck, uh, Lubeck flap will definitely enhance the visibility, accessibility, incisions are easy, reflection are easy, repositioning of the flap after surgery is easy and also maintain integrity of the gingival attachment. However, the horizontal component you have in ocean Lubeck, Lubeck flap which is given in the buccal attached gingiva, it disrupts the blood supply and you can see the two vertical components we have, they will cross the mucogingival junction. Now, one more thing about the trapezoidal flap that we have in the full thickness flap. The trapezoidal flap, of course, will have a horizontal incision given in the sulcular and it is having also the two vertical releasing flap. However, in the trapezoidal flap, you have an angled vertical releasing incision and that angled vertical releasing incision will help in keeping the wider zone of incision in the vestibular area as compared to the sulcular area.